Uh, well, welcome everyone. I uh, hope you're all having a great day. I appreciate uh, you guys coming here uh, and listening to our presentation today. Uh, we're super excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all and hopefully we'll be able to uh, teach you all something uh, pretty valuable here. So um, I was uh, gonna tell a little multicast uh, joke uh, to kick us off, but I don't think you guys are quite ready to receive it. So I have uh, another networking joke for you. Uh, what did the Mercedes dealer say to the TCP packet? No, nothing. He gave him gave him his keys and a firm handshake. <laughs> so, did, did you get that? You yeah. got it. You got it. Yeah, you got it. No, you didn't get it. <laughs> Just wait till you hear the UDP one. Uh, You'll never get that one. All right, so um, hopefully you caught all three of those punchlines there. But uh, so jokes aside, our goal for the next 20 minutes or so is to uh, not to give you guys a lecture, but instead kind of open a dialogue here um, so you can learn about how university partnerships can help, help you all achieve your open source goals. And then to build off of that as like a conversation piece, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to just raise your hand. We'll also have time for a Q&A at the end as well, though. Uh, so then we're just going to tell you a little bit about ourselves. So my name is Ben Smith Foley. Uh, I'm a senior at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York. Um, I'm studying computer science there with a concentration in systems and software. Uh, and I'm currently conducting research in network security. Uh, and I'm also working in product security engineering with Boeing. Uh, this is my first uh, time attending uh, and speaking at a conference, so pretty excited. Uh, I'm Sam Vegan. I'm a junior at RPI. I'm a mentor, which is like one step below a coordinator at the Rensselaer Center for Open Source. And I'm currently leading a cloud native open source project at RPI through our open source center, which we'll tell you all about. This is also my first time speaking and attending a conference. So I mentioned it before, but our objective today is to shed light on a world of opportunity uh, that you may not have known existed out there. So. Um, that is open source centers that are at universities. So we're going to be treading along four main topics today. The first one being the current challenges that exist in the cloud native security ecosystem. The second being knowledge gaps that are present uh, in the world of security. The third being university open source centers, what they are. And the fourth and final one being the path forward so you all can take action on this opportunity. Uh, so let's start with current challenges in the cloud native security landscape and then its relation to open source. So we're all aware how important security minded software is. Unfortunately, we also know that it's often overlooked. A uh, quick show of hands if you've experienced conflict with your software teams over security requirements. Anybody? Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> the reality is that unfortunately not all software engineers have any experience with security, especially interns and new grads. Uh, now, where does this lack of experience come from? I believe there's a few reasons. To start, internships are too short and highly selective. There's a very little chance for interns to become fully acclimated to the tech stack that they're using in three months or even in six months for a co-op. This moves us nicely into our next point, that significant resource constraints with full-time members, time, and money. Wouldn't it be better if you had access to free, resor well, free resources I know this sounds like a dream, but it's true. Utilizing university students through open source programs is entirely plausible for your needs and is done by people every day. That brings us to our third challenge, that new software engineers entering the field do not have security on the forefront of their mind. Even though, and these stats are from the Linux Foundation Research Team and the 10th Annual Open Source Jobs Report, cybersecurity skills have the fourth biggest impact on hiring decisions, reported by 40% of employers trailing only cloud, Linux, and DevOps, which is to be expected. And then even amongst professionals, 77% state they would benefit from additional cybersecurity training. Shouldn't this be standardized training? Shouldn't everybody have to go through this? So how do we fix this? First, we have to look at what's happening in schools now. So the current state of the curriculum uh, in universities now um, is not the best, uh, to be honest with you. Um, realistically, we can't force universities to constantly update their curriculum with the newest trends, the newest uh, security uh, things that come out. So instead, we look at where else can we get this information to students who are eventually going to be working at all of your companies. And the answer to that is an open source center. So uh, the current state of open source uh, centers in school, uh, believe it or not, most computer science students uh, don't learn about containerization they don't learn about orchestration, and they don't learn about security. 
unless they choose to take elective classes their senior year, their last year there. So you have a plethora of students who are graduating and going into entry level roles who have no background in any of this stuff that is just standard across the industry. So I can tell you guys a little story here. Um, so uh, a few months back, I was giving a talk at a university uh, about um, a CNI project that I was working on uh, related to psyllium. And uh, at the conclusion of the project, uh, a few students came, came down to me, a group of six or seven of them. They were all seniors. They were a couple months away from graduating. And they asked me if I could explain in layman's terms what Docker is. Um, and I was a little bit concerned after hearing that. Um, and that's kind of what really motivated me to dive a little bit deeper into this. Um, because these are you know, key tools and technologies that are used now, and, and there's just a huge disconnect here. So um, some more quick uh, stats from that uh, 10th annual open source jobs report from the Linux Foundation. 69% um, of employers are currently seeking cloud and container skills, and 71% of open source professionals say these skills are in high demand right now. So shouldn't we be ensuring our next generation of security professionals are well versed in these skills and school's curriculum unfortunately moves too slow for this to happen. Um, however, luckily enough, there's been a recent push uh, to bring open source centers into schools which looks to be the perfect solution to this problem. Uh, so there's a few different examples of types of open source centers. There's undergraduate open source centers like Arcos, which we represent, you'll hear about more later. Um, that really aim to differentiate, differentiate curriculum um, and provide learning for resources outside of classes like containerization, even using Docker, as simple as that seems. Um, it also really serves to cultivate community. Um, we'll have students from Arcos, from engineering majors, uh, Arrows, Mechies, whatever, come in with a vision uh, an for an application or an app or any piece of software and pitch their idea and then find people that can bring it into reality, which I think is very cool. Um, and then you also just learn how to work in a team on a project. You know, you make meaningful commits. You learn how to use Git, if you haven't done that before, um, and effectively collaborate. Um, this also empowers students to develop open source solutions to real world problems so that when they do get into the workforce, they can make an impact. And of course, learning these technologies increases employment rates at schools with open source programs. Uh, undergraduates are learning applicable skills. That's as, that's as simple as it gets. There are also a, a few other types of open source programs. There's um, four that fall under Red Hat, um, like funding. Arcos is one, and there's three others, which are pretty grad student or PhD student focused. Uh, there's the Purdue, Purdue Research Center for Open Digital Innovation, the Oregon State Open Source Lab, and then the UC Santa Cruz Center for Research and Open Source Software. And then there's also a few organizations um, that are a bit more broad and have more members, but aren't as, as focused um, into helping individual schools. Uh, one is Helios Open, which is an open scholarship program with 60 plus universities. So that encompasses open source uh, software, but it's not their, their main goal. There's also teaching open source, which uh, a few professors at RPI do use. And that is just to prepare instructors to empower students to participate in open source projects com and communities. And then it's also a source for, for teaching materials and uh, providing support for student involvement in open source, so any conferences or hackathons or anything like that that's happening. Uh, just providing awareness for that. And then there's also Curios, uh, which is a community for those working in university and research institution OSPOS. And its main goal is to facilitate the networking and collaboration between Curios representatives. So there's about 20 members of 20 universities um, or just research institutions worldwide. So Arcos, short for the Rensselaer Center for Open Source, I'm, I'm sure you picked that up by now, uh, is a key example of a successful open source program. So it is a member of the OSI, the Open Source Initiative. It is the first and largest student-run open source center in the world. Uh, students majoring in everything from computer science and electrical engineering all the way to finance and psychology enroll in the course and take it as they would any other class at the university. And it is the course with the highest enrollment across all departments at RPI. And the craziest thing is it doesn't count for anything other than free elective credit. You don't get anything meaningful towards your degree, which tells you the students who are taking this are taking it because they know that it's for their own personal development or their own passion for learning more. So our coast bolsters thousands of alumni, over 1,000 projects since its founding, ranging from little 2D games that can be played uh, to cloud-native technology and financial AI. 
Um, so it was founded in 2006 by an alum of our Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and Arcos received funding from Red Hat in 2015 after its initial grant was exhausted. Now, there are a few company sponsors, currently IBM, Red Hat, and Boeing, namely, and there's a few non-profit sponsors as well. Uh, Soundscape is the name of one, um, and AI for, for Finance is another. So a sponsor, uh, as we call them, is somebody who just helps students who are enrolled in Arcos with open source projects. So I'll talk about specifics of what that entails in a little bit. But these companies bring real world projects uh, to students that include the use of critical technologies to them. Uh, and there are, in addition to that, hundreds of student-led projects. Students come here with their own ideas. Um, and we do our best to be able to provide the funding, the infrastructure, the lessons they need to be able to turn their idea into a reality. So. Um, like I said before, it's the largest open source uh, campus organization in the country, uh, and we're trying to help build more organizations like Arcos across the country at some of the schools that may not have a program like that right now. So some main benefits for all of you here and why, why this matters to all of you. So if you were to work with an open source center like Arcos, you would have access to hundreds of students at one university or thousands and tens of thousands at multiple. So you get access to a huge diverse talent pool there. Uh, students coming in from a vast array of backgrounds can give fresh different perspectives to your efforts. You can identify potential early hires, right? You can be working with students for over a year uh, on these open source projects. And if that's somebody who you think would be a good fit at your company, you've already vetted them for a year. Uh, so you're not really taking as much of a chance on them. Um, you can accomplish work that's outside of your team's capacity. Um, let's be honest, like 99% of us uh, don't have the time or willpower to get to every single tedious task in our backlog. Um, those of you who do wake up in the morning pumped to write documentation, I envy you. Um, but that's an example of something that may seem like a little bit of a waste of time on our plate, but it's something that can you know, be pawned off to a student who can learn an immense amount of uh, knowledge from, from doing that and your task gets completed. Um, and it's all free. You don't have to pay them. They're not, they're not interns. <laughs> um, so new hires uh, in your company will also uh, enter your company already having some experience with some relevant technologies. So like I mentioned before in that story, uh, you know, you're not going to have students who are entering not knowing containerization topics. Instead, uh, you'll have a student who odds are they're familiar with all of your uh, tool tools and technologies that you use, uh, including security-related cloud-native technologies. So um, again, according to the Linux Foundation research team, 93% of managers said open source talent is difficult to find. Companies are hiring consultants and paying an insane amount of money for training for new hires. Uh, and there was a reported 68% growth of cloud migration in companies in the past year alone. So I've seen plenty of new hires at every company out there spend a huge chunk of their time for the first year plus just in training, learning the basics of stuff that they really should already know. Um, and as you would expect, the students who do have earlier exposure to these things excel um, and end up adjusting to their new, ro new roles a lot faster. So the last important thing is sustainability here. You know that once you set up this program, you're always going to have students who are coming in who are excited to work. You're never going to have to worry about uh, trying to find new talent. So that's a constant pipeline that you have. Some of the benefits for students on the flip side, they get real world experience. They get some potential career opportunities. Uh, they get mentorship. Uh, they can learn technologies beyond their school's curriculum. And they get an early uh, development of passion for open source, which is pretty important. So we're all familiar with the DevSecOps infinity loop. So the theme of that diagram is fluid integration. And I'll encourage everybody here to think about how this idea of integrating students into your open source security solutions relates to the DSO infinity loop. So you develop awesome security solutions. You involve students like us in your work. We go on to enter the workforce with a background in security and a passion for open source, we develop awesome security solutions. So you can see how it all relates to each other and how this is going to pay off in the long run. So the whole thing starts over again. And this is a bottom-up approach to security training and education. Uh, it's hard to get teams sometimes to prioritize security. Uh, it's difficult to get engineers or managers to want to spend time on those things. So um, instead, they're going to want to be working on features. So 
Uh, like I said before, most working individuals do not have the background in security besides the mandatory training. So how do we solve this? We go from the bottom up, which is actually at the university level. You start teaching students these concepts and then they're entering ready to go. Uh, someone that we've worked with before, Damani Corbin, left us this quote. Uh, he shared that his collaboration with the Center for Open Source at RPI has been immensely beneficial. It not only enhances Boeing's capabilities, but also adds significant value in shaping the future of cybersecurity and open source development. Okay, so looking ahead, collaborations between companies and university open source centers can lead to a more secure, innovative, and resilient open source ecosystem. We hope that in the near future, or maybe a little bit longer, uh, you guys will be inclined to, to pitch or find or choose a project, uh, anything, a, a passion project, something that's happening in your job, anything like that, and reach out to your local university or find a group of students um, or an organization like Arcos. We have plenty of professionals come to Arcos and pitch their passion projects so that they can see them get worked on if they don't necessarily have the time for it. Yeah, just find a project lead or interested individuals and then eventually benefit either your team or your company or even your own passion project. Uh, all of this will lead to less training and less onboarding, which then in turn is happier interns and a happier full-time team. Uh, if nothing else, please be receptive to student reach out and be an open source beneficiary. So uh, how do you all get involved? So first step is to talk to your local university. If you have one, you can find a program, or if you're super ambitious, you can help create one. Uh, it's, it's really you know, not that difficult to open the, the dialogue with them. It's a lot simpler than you may expect. Um, there are a few different ways that you can actually be a sponsor. So at Arcos, we have three main different types of sponsors. Some companies will uh, pick a few projects that they think are uh, worthwhile to see some contributions be made to the open source community, and they'll give students a small stipend to work on them for the semester, which incentivizes students to pick those projects. Other companies, they provide infrastructure for students to use, right? That stuff costs money for us, and we have no money <laughs> as college students. So that's super helpful for all of us to be able to get some experience with some good infrastructure and other, any other resources that may be relevant. And the third one, and probably the coolest, is uh, providing a mentor. So some companies will actually have an engineer, somebody on their team who's kind enough to donate some time, just an hour every week or two. And they sit down with the students and actually help walk them through the entire process of the project they're working on. So that's where you gain the most visibility into the program. And even if you're an individual, if you're not interested in bringing your company in, you can still be a mentor. You, there are great people who work with some students and coach them about open source, about security. I would not be standing here right now if it weren't for a mentor who introduced me to the world of open source, introduced me to cloud native security and cloud native security con. So it's a great opportunity to get more people like me to come out to these things and then eventually help you guys in return. So uh, if you're here representing a university, of which there might be some of you, there might not. Uh, my call, there you go. My, my call to you is to uh, invest in your students. So look into what, it, what has to be done to be able to start a course like this or uh, you know, provide some sort of seminar-based course to just teach students about some of these things and really try to drive home that point to them that they, at the end of the day, all they care about is getting a job. That's the entire reason they're in school. So if you are able to show them that you know, this is some of the stuff that's important for them to learn, they're head over heels excited about it. So um, it's giving the students an opportunity to thrive. Uh, now we'd like to open the floor for any questions you might have about the presentation, about our experiences in open source, anything. So sure, so I can answer that question. So the question was, uh, if a student is already on track to get a degree, do they need to present some sort of project, uh, research, something along those lines in order to actually get the degree? And the answer to that is actually no. So most of the bachelor's programs, um, there, I'm sure there are a few schools that have exceptions, you just need to complete classes along a base track, the basic requirements, and then you get your degree in computer science. Now, there are some graduate programs, whether they're master's programs, PhD programs that are more research focused, where you do need to complete a research project. You need to present that to a panel. You need to defend uh, your research that you're doing and stuff like that. But 
the amount of PhDs that are employed at your company versus bachelor's and master's is significantly lower. So actually, the amount of students who have exposure to really working on their own projects like this is pretty minimal. You want to start and I'll finish up? Sure. Yeah, so just a quick recap. Uh, the question was, uh, there's actually a huge disconnect within the industry, not even considering uh, students about some of these uh, security solutions, uh, so, you know, keeping them as up to date as possible, these uh, new cloud native technologies and stuff, there's still a bit of a struggle there. So as uh, for the Rensselaer Center of Open Source, they have a number of company connections through sponsorships. Do we have some sort of communication into uh, the solutions on their front? Did I capture all of that good? Yeah. So. Um, I can answer that specifically on the Boeing front. So I um, obviously introduced Boeing to the Rensselaer Open Source Center. And uh, Boeing, as I'm sure all of your companies, is not perfect in their open source center, right? Like there's still plenty of issues that exist, but it's less about the company that's behind it, and it's more about the mentor. So Damani Corbin, who was mentioned before, was the representative from Boeing's OSPO who became a mentor to Sam and myself. So he spent the semester basically teaching us all about all of these different cloud native technologies. We honed in on some security solutions and we took it from there. So it's kind of almost like you can think of it as another professor coming in to teach some students some things. So from there, it's, it's less about you know, trying to create a flawless implementation of a goal of Boeing's, for example, or any company that has an open source project. And the companies more have an interest in just trying to contribute towards the next generation of students, just being able to approach these problems from a critical thinking perspective and not have something be super foreign to them as soon as they, as soon as they start out. So did I miss anything? No, I think, I think Ben did a pretty good job of encapsulating it there. Um, and with that in mind, it really, some of the technologies that you'd be exposed to due to something like this, like through Damani, like I had never set up a, a backlog or anything like that before Arcos. Um, and now I'm a project lead of uh, a small team of six people. Um, but that, that's still experience that I never would have gotten it without this. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody else? Yeah, so I can take that one because I came into this with no knowledge at all. Um, we started our first Arcos project in the spring, so very recently. Uh, we're in our second semester. This is like a summer semester. Um, and Ben took me in under his wing. Um, and we started working on a, um, like through Cilium, we want to set up a CNI test suite. Um, it, it, it's really just a matter of documentation, documentation, documentation. Really striving to, every single time you sit down and work on it, you don't have to make a commit. You don't have to write any code. But learn something else. Um, find a new technology, understand the basics, and then how does that fit with everything else? And then once you've done that for, it took me months. Um, basically the entire spring semester, I was just doing that. I was writing documentation. I was creating a, like a markdown file of everything that I thought would be needed for onboarding new people in the spring now that we have uh, four more. Um, and just recently I became confident enough to you know, write my own Terraform and push to our to our repo. Um, so it's really just a process. You just kind of got to start learning and document everything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll speak for Cilium because I know that we've looked at that as well. They, if you go into the into the repo, they have like on GitHub, they have different tags of issues, and a lot of them um, are tagged like uh, first time commit or anything like that, or um, like e easy or something like that. So if you look at any of those, a lot of them are 
either changing some type of, type of documentation or maybe like a few lines of code, something easy that you can definitely start out with. Uh, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, so the question was just thinking back to the first time stepping in Arcos, uh, what was kind of the draw there that really helped to kind of uh, develop uh, me as a student? Because there are mentors that exist in the real world, and they can be tough to come by sometimes. So um, when I, I, I thought I joined Arcos my very first semester in college, uh, at that point, I had no idea what I was doing. I picked computer science for my major because it sounded the coolest. And I hopped on a project that IBM was running, one of our sponsors. And it was about running a machine learning pipeline in a Kubernetes cluster. And that was like another language to me. I had no idea what was going on. I sat there pretending like I knew what was going on. But I then would go from that environment into my computer science 101 class and be like, well, this is pretty boring, you know? So uh, I think the main great thing about students is that they inherently want to learn. That's what they're in their institution for. And obviously, plenty of us would like to learn more. I'm sure everybody here is here to learn more, right? Uh, but you have an entire massive population of students who that's what they want to do, and their goal is to get a job. So if a job goes to them with an opportunity to learn, they're going to be head over heels excited for it. So that's kind of the whole point of you know, where we're trying to go with this here is that there's a huge untapped market here that really there's only one big open source center right now that's, that's starting to take advantage of this. So I think it is kickstarted by companies coming in and kind of providing those opportunities for students because that's what gets people involved. I, the fact that IBM, a name that I knew, was there was what got me hooked. Because I'm like, I want a job. Maybe working at IBM would be cool someday. Let me check out what they're about. So that's, yeah. yeah and I would say on the, on the other end of that as well, for the students who maybe don't care as much about joining an established project, as long as you make commits and progress towards, a, towards something, you can do any project you want. Um, so like in each core computer science class, you have scheduled homework, so scheduled language, um, like exams. No one wants to take exams. Uh, where Arcos is, is four credits, just as many as another class. And you can do whatever you want, as long as you actually put effort in. I think that's a huge allure for a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, we're just running out of time here. So uh, I really appreciate all of you for your time and your attention here. And, and special thank you to the Linux Foundation and CNCF for putting on this this awesome event here. So if you'd like to connect with us, here are contact details. If you're interested in working more with students in open source centers, if you want some advice, uh, we can facilitate introductions to a whole number of universities. We're going to hang out outside for a bit. So uh, we would love to be able to chat with you. Or if you have any other questions, you can catch us out there. So um, thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful day and, and a fun day tomorrow. So thank you. Yes, thank you, guys. <laughs>